66 million years ago, an asteroid tore through the Earth's crust, causing the extinction of the non-avian dinosaurs and many other types of plants and animals that lived alongside them. The asteroid impact spat debris into the atmosphere, creating the KPG boundary that can be seen in the rocks millions of years later. And study of the rock layers just after this event show us that the devastation was not bad for every species on the planet. Hidden in the rocks in New Zealand and other places around the world is a large increase in fungal spores, quickly preceding the boundary, showing that this was actually a pretty good time to be a fungus. The high humidity, low sunlight, and the fact the earth was covered in dead things meant that there was a pure fungus feast available to be gorged on. And genetic data shows that it was at this time that the earliest known agriculture took place. 65 million years later, in the thick jungles of Brazil, ant queens have to journey from their birth colony to found a new one. After mating, they will find a suitable place, lose their wings, and then dig into the ground. This stage of the life cycle is called the nuptial flight, and other than small variations, this is a pretty normal affair for any species of ant found across the world. But what makes this journey different for certain species found in Central and South America is that the queen ant carry with them a gift from their birth colony a small amount of fungus in their mouth that will become the, the central pillar the new colony will be built on. They will protect and feed the fungus and in return they get a source of food. The existence of non-human animals that can farm for their food is so intriguing because it feels difficult to work out how it could have evolved. Agriculture is complicated, it requires complex cooperation between fellow species members that need to work together towards an end goal that doesn't have an instant reward. So it is difficult to make sense of animals that couldn't have been consciously aware of what they were doing behaving this way. And this is just the tip of the iceberg, with insect agriculture being so much more complex than anyone could have ever thought possible. Some ants have evolved to the point where they have actually domesticated their own versions of the fungus. And ants are just one group of insect agriculturalists, with there being hundreds of termite and beetle species that farm fungus. And there are even some insects that farm livestock. Wood ants have been observed keeping aphids in one area and protecting them from predators in order to feed on their honeydew, which is excess sugar secretions from their food. There are actually some 240 different species of fungus farming ants, and the complexity of the farming varies greatly between the different species. The fungus farming ants are known as the atines, and the archetypal fungus farmers are the leafcut ants, travelling back and forward through the jungle with uniform order, carrying leaf cuttings several times their body size and have a very complex relationship with their fungus. The fungus these ants use is from the same family as the leucocoprinus mushrooms, however, the fungus that most of the higher atines farm is no longer able to reproduce with wild members of the family. This is because most of the leafcutters have been farming for so many generations, it has actually speciated and has become a unique species that is dependent on the ants for survival. The queen ants take a small amount of fungus in their oral cavity when they found a new colony, ensuring the continuation of the specific fungus they have a symbiosis with. However, it is not just technically another species, and the fungus has adapted very differently to its wild relatives, specifically to cater to the needs of the ants. Many of the fungus that are farmed by ants have growths known as gongolydia that are highly nutritious and their shape makes them easy to remove and harvest by the ants. The ants have also changed their behaviour and created new regimes around the fungus, like bringing it water and creating specific parts of their colony for it to grow. The majority of ant species don't store their food in their colony, they store it in themselves in something called a crop, which is a pouch above their stomach. They can then share this food with other ants in the colony feeding mouth to mouth, so fungus farming ants are actually pretty unique for having a specific location to store their food. And also the cutting of leaves is something that ants most likely started doing after becoming fungus farmers. At the lower end of the complexity scale are the lower atines. The lower atines do not feed on a unique species of fungus, and just farm species that grow in the wild. The most reliable distinguishing factor between the leafcutters or the higher atines and the lower atines is actually that whereas the leafcutters exclusively feed their gardens using fresh grass and leaf cuttings, the lower atines use a much more diverse range of food for their fungus gardens. This may involve some fresh leaf cuttings, but the majority of it is dead and decaying flowers, wood, spiders and insects. The fungus food sources are much closer to what the fungus would consume in the wild. If the fungus in their colony dies out, they can even refill their gardens using wild fungus. 
Interestingly, there is actually another small group of ants known as the Aterostigma that have actually convergently evolved with the leafcutters. Earlier in their evolution, they changed the fungus they grow in their gardens for a fungus of a completely different family known as the coral funguses. But now, like the leafcutters, have been farming this new family of fungus for so many generations, they are also unable to reproduce with wild fungus. The issue is that even the lower atines, the most primitive fungus farmers, are still actually quite advanced. Many atine species, including the lower atine species, have lost the gene that synthesizes the amino acid arginine, and it is hypothesized that this has actually made them incapable of living off other food sources, as this nutrient must now be obtained from the fungus crop. Out of all the fungus ants alive today, there aren't any known that eat fungus along with other foods. So how did they evolve? There are two main theories of how the fungus got into the ant colonies for them to start feeding on it. One is that the fungus could have grown along the cave walls of their colony if they had dug into leaf litter, and the ants began to feed on it. The other theory is that the fungus could have got into their colony through their spores being dispersed by the ants. Study of ants has found that although they are not known to consume fungus outside of farming, they do sometimes accidentally consume fungal spores that are considered a waste product along with other substances by their intestines and discarded as pellets, sometimes inside their nest. So this could have been another way that the fungus was able to get inside the colony for a symbiosis to form. Also, the way ants dispel the pellet is actually in a very similar process to how some ant queens carry their fungus to the new colony they are founding during the nuptial flight. The incentive for ants to start evolving to farm fungus could have been due to the time that the first fungus farmers started attending their crop. DNA evidence pinpoint the common ancestor of all the fungus farming ants living around 60 million years ago, just after the KPG extinction that killed off the dinosaurs. Some researchers have hypothesized the conditions in the aftermath of the asteroid impact would have been very favorable to ants that have evolved to feed on a fungus crop. During the low light conditions, the fungus would have been a crop that was much more reliable than other food sources. However, so far, no studies have proven cause and effect, but the years following the extinction event seem like the perfect timing for this to be true. One issue with this theory is that ants are the earliest known animals to achieve agriculture, and the other insect agriculturalists didn't come until much later. Fungus farming termites, for instance, most likely evolved around 30 million years ago, much later when the conditions would have been different. So what was their selective pressure? Interestingly, unlike ants, there are many examples of termites and bark beetles species interacting with fungus in the wild outside of the farming species. For instance, there are termite species that are specifically attracted to wood that has been affected by fungus. There are non-fungus feeding relatives of bark beetles still living today that are very important spreaders of fungal spores, and what's more is that the fungus used in bark beetles' nests are related to the free-living species of fungi that depend on the bark beetles and other bugs for their spore dispersal. Farming evolved once among the Atine ants, so at some point the lower Atine ants and the higher Atines would have had a common ancestor, so the different degrees in complexity in which these ants look after their fungus gardens offer us clues of how these more complex forms would have started out. But for this complex relationship of the higher Atines to start to evolve, how were the fungus able to speciate and become a new species in the first place? Out of the many species of animals and plants that humans have domesticated, they have always been through disrupting the gene flow with their wild relatives, at least temporarily. This is a type of speciation known as allopatric speciation, where two populations of animals or plants eventually become a separate species due to being unable to reproduce with each other due to a natural barrier like a mountain range or an ocean. However, in the case of humans, this would be through unnatural things like selective breeding or removing animals from the wild. However, in the case of ant species that have domesticated their funguses, like leafcutters, their colonies are surrounded by wild versions of their fungus crop, so how could they have disrupted the gene flow? Extensive study of the ants has shown that while the Atine ants first started farm fungus in the jungles of Central and South America, the ancestors of the higher Atines probably evolved in drier habitats, specifically the savanna highlands that stretch across Central Brazil. Either through natural migration of the ants into these drier habitats or climate change causing these regions to receive less rainfall and dry up. This would create an environment that was unavailable for the wild fungus adapted to wet tropical rainforests. 
However, as the ant fungus would be looked after by the ants, it was able to continue to reproduce and develop in isolation from the wild fungus. Then due to the advantages that the domesticated fungus brings them, ants like the leafcutters were able to recolonize the wetter lowlands. So the ants are definitely not efficiently stripping leaves deliberately. They are not consciously aware of what they are doing, but through a unique set of circumstances and a perfect co-evolution with their crop, they were able to beat humans to the game of agriculture by as much as 60 million years. Thank you for watching. A big thank you goes to all my patrons, especially the big contributors that are listed here. If you like content like this, then consider becoming a patron as well.